Welcome to a very special edition of the LifeWorks podcast. We are here on location at Pearman Cellars Winery in Broad Run, Virginia. It is nestled between Washington, D.C. and the Shenandoah Mountains and offers wine for all palates and all you know, types of people. Regardless of whether you drink wine or not, Pearman Cellars offers something for everyone, not just wine, but incredible history, incredible background, incredible views, as you can see behind me, and incredible company. Chris, thank you so much Mark. for joining me. Happy to be here. I'm impressed <laughs> to be here. And thank you for visiting and allowing us to show you what we've been doing for the last few decades here. I'm really excited to be here. It's phenomenal what you do. It's like you have a, you have a golden touch when it comes to wineries. Thank you. We've, we've restored three properties from the 1700s into wineries. And Virginia is so rich with history. You can't kick a tree without having George Washington left underneath it or peed on it. So <laughs> the, the history here is amazing. And it's real and it's tangible. And it's great that we have the opportunity to keep this alive and, and, and healthy in a way that allows people to touch, learn, and, and keep history close to them, which I think is important. And tell us a little bit about the history of Virginia wine. Uh, Virginia wine goes back to 1619. Was well, this 400 years? The first House of Burgesses, which is basically the first organized um, government that we had, the 12th law passed, the 12th act required all landowners, which were men at the time, to plant grapevines. King James brought over 10,000 grapevines from France and hired several winemakers from France to help keep the need of bringing alcohol from the old world to the new world and make this more sustainable. I think they probably miserably failed. It's not easy <laughs> growing grapes and they learned some of the difficulties that we had. So there's not a lot of history of the wine that was produced. There's a lot of history of the toils of growing grapes and the, the wines weren't, weren't so good for the first few years. So uh, I, I argue 400 years of wine history in Virginia, and we finally got it right. We might be a little yeah. slow, but I think we've got it the last few decades. What, what do you think is the difference between the old world and the new world? People talk about old world wines, new world wines. Mm -hmm. Old world wine, more about terroir. People who are wine geeks often talk about terroir, flavors of place. When you have vines that are highly densely planted, the fruit may not become as ripe. It's very terroir driven. You want the flavors of fruit, you want the flavors of age, you want the flavors of terroir, the soil that it was grown in. The new world wines tend to be much more fruit driven, much more alcohol, much more intensely fruit. And in doing so, you add a lot more oak flavor and newer oak barrels to the wine to balance out the intensity of oak and alcohol to make the wine more complex, if you will. And Virginia is stylistically and geographically located halfway between the old world and the new world. So I argue that we have a little bit of both. Our yields are lower, our vine density is higher, a lot of our ways of smaller agriculture are more old world driven. We don't have the power that California and some of the new world places have for fruit ripeness. We don't have that type of alcohol drive. So I think we, we sit at the benefit of both, the old world, the new world, Virginia. What are the conditions that make a good vintage? You go shop mm -hmm. for, for a bottle of wine and you see a year, 2018, 2017, 2020. How do you differentiate a good year from bad year? Well, grapes are an agricultural product and, and they are annual harvest. We pick grapes right here, September, October. And so like apples, peaches, and other annualized perennial crops, you want to have the seasons. Mm -hmm. So where apples are grown, where peaches are grown, olives, you often find grapes as well. So you need to have the seasons, the dormancy in the winter time. For us, we are sensitive to frost, no different than apples and peaches. So we want to have elevation away from the frost of late frost or early frost in the fall. Drain soils are very important. For us in Virginia, generally 600 foot elevation tends to be the beginning place and a safe place for well, getting away from frost issues. 200 million years ago, Washington DC was underwater. Some say it still is financial, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to go there. So we're at 600 foot elevation, and if you can go to 29, there's actually old uh, fossilized marine fossils that we, we find on occasion, which is cool to know that the old sediment beds and the old metamorphic rock that is from the old ancient seabeds don't provide 
good soil drain. It's a lot of clay in that area. So once you get above 600 feet, we have good soil drainage, and also we get away from the frost issues. A hot, dry summer, like today, yeah. and uh, a dry autumn is awesome. We want rain intermittently, and uh, the cadence. Making wines like making food. There's a lot of decisions, a lot of work involved, and if you were to just stretch out Thanksgiving to a calendar year, that's what we do here. We think, plan, we move slow like baseball. We talk to people who have idyllic growing conditions where it never rains like in Southern California. <laughs> and they come and visit and they say, there's no irrigation here. How did the vines look so good? I said, it rains. They go, I go, how do you, you know, it's a funny conversation that people don't have the control. How many pounds of grapes does it take to make a single bottle? Two or three, I would assume. We measure vineyards by the acre and we get about three tons of fruit per acre. One ton of fruit will yield about 150 gallons, or in my sale programs, I use 63 cases. And then from that point, uh, 63 cases of wine is two and a half barrels. So two and a half barrels per ton, and maybe seven or eight barrels per acre. And working backwards from there, we get about 180 cases of grapes, maybe upwards of 200 cases of grapes per acre. Hmm. So 2,000, 2,500, um, bottles per acre. Wow. We have, we started with 726 vines per acre. We've doubled that. So we're running closer to 1500 vines per acre. So we're down to probably two bottles of wine per vine. And if we get 10 pounds per vine, that would put four or five pounds. But if you want to count the hours that go into managing a vineyard of 250 man hours per acre, we're looking at a hundred man hours per ton which equates to why wine is expensive. It's a lot of work. We have full-time yeah. staff on our vineyard and I work with them all the time. It's, it's a passion love. When a vineyard, 85% of the work in the vineyard is not related to harvest. We visit each vine and work with each vine individually 11 times in the growing season. From pruning, leaf thinning, uh, chipping, hedging, thinning out the vines. There's a lot of work that we do throughout the course of the year. So the harvest is important, but I would argue for the next three weeks, we put more labor into it than actually harvest itself. So we live in a world of controversy right now and, and probably have for quite some time. You watch Facebook. No, <laughs> I, I do watch Facebook. <laughs> Clearly. And I'm sure that the wine business is not immune to controversy. What are the big controversies in the wine business today? Oh, well, it's uh, cans. Wine cans. Well, twist off. Remember twist off. That right, was a big right. thing. I will never have a twist off wine. You know, I have to pull a cork and people would ask me, why would you ever twist off a bottle of wine? I said, my right. grandfather had this lovely old car from the 1920s and he would go and hand crank his car and he would say, who would ever push a button to turn a key to have their engine going? I can do it this way. You gotta do it this way. Right. And I was like, why are you knocking futs? So I think that they have benefits of understanding wines evolution in the vineyard, wine's evolution in the bottle aging process, once it's in the bottle, and have the customer experience better. And it's nice to have the presentation. So, you know, 1985 Chardonnay, and you go through all the twist off, you open it up, and present the cork, and you paste it for you, you go, look, oh, it's lovely. And you go yeah. through all these things, sure. Sure. Um, and the presentation's <laughs> great. Or you know, like, hey man, you see the ball game last night? How, yeah, this is really good. How was your, yeah. it depends on, wine is no different than food. Mm. And if you're in an environment where that plate of food in front of you is put together with a lot of love and a lot of value, a lot of time, and you really want to focus on that fruit, there's a place for that. Mm -hmm. And if you want a Panera sandwich, you want to talk about a ball game, there's a place for that. And so I think they're all linked. So as our alcohol industry evolves, Virginia went from wineries to distilleries to breweries to mm -hmm. cideries to where I call these alcoholeries, and now we're going to have dispensaries. So there are many places one can get their buzz on, and ours <laughs> right, right. is so seeped in agriculture, yeah. and that's really what our roots are. Not all of the buzzeries are agriculturally intense as we are, and then the creative side comes in. So you go have a nice IPA that has ginger and apricot and cardamom in it, mm -hmm. and it's called well, I can't say that in public, but there's creative <laughs> names that, you know, 
Wombat Challenge I saw last night. It was a Wombat Challenge about a beer. So the creative yeah. drinks and creative foods and infusions that we have are interesting. Some of them are fantastic. Starbucks Stout with vanilla ice cream is awesome. So I think the creative evolution of alcohol is important for us. When we hit prohibition in 1920 and it ended in 1933, we lost a lot of heritage of alcohol. And before that, this country didn't make wine. We made beer, we made distillates. And that was part of the problem of going through the um, industrial revolution, the use of alcohol, because generally beer and distillates, you don't have a food. Wine is more socialized with food. And so if you had more wine in the evolutionary process earlier in our country's history, I think we would have evolved into a better foodie type European appreciation of food and where, where our food comes from. 2% of the people are farmers in our country. But a lot of people in cities across the world don't really fully understand the work that goes into agriculture. And I think the creativity is now coming back to allow where flavors come from and where quality is about. And hopefully that'll keep our winery going. I've been on this property 27 years and hopefully yeah. a few more. What's the most mind-blowing thing about wine making if people knew it? Like you just totally astounding to them. Tasting fresh grape juice before it's fermented into wine. Mm. So come back here, end of September, look at the grapes. We're gonna pick a few grapes. Yeah. We're gonna press them into grape juice. It's gonna go into a tank. We process about 10 tons a day of fruit, which is 1,500 gallons of juice and taste that fresh juice. It's like liquid banana. It's gonna be about 24% sugar. It's gonna have intense flavor. It's gonna have a longevity. Go to the grocery store and get a smoothie. Thick, rich, yummy. It is not that rich, but it, it's going that direction. If you get grape juice from the grocery store and go, hey, Chris, here's some grape juice. Wanna make some wine out of it? It's on sale for $1.99. I'm going, it has no flavor. Fresh grape juice is amazing. And sadly, we only have it for, from the vineyard to the wine takes such a short amount of time and we're focusing and not giving away grape juice. That if you get that opportunity, that's pretty cool. Tell me about the people who drink wine. Tell me about that demographic. How old are they? What are they like? How successful are they? Tell me about the, your customer, your local customer. I think people who appreciate, if you appreciate a motor vehicle, if you appreciate music, if you appreciate good food, which is probably its closest similarity. When I was in China trying to help open up a lot of Chinese wine shops and their drink salute is gambai, which gambai. is knock it back, basically, right? down it, gambai. And mm -hmm. so we had this wonderful meal, $800 bottle of wine, and it's the first growth from Bordeaux. And they're going, gambai. I'm going, no, gambai. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm trying to explain it's about health, appreciation. It's about having something that is spend the time to appreciate the work, effort, time, love, passion that went into this product. It's not a beer, no offense to beer, but, but I think the people who enjoy the most that wine has to offer spend the time to appreciate the nuances and complexity. So wine is the most complex thing that we eat, more so than chicken, asparagus, beef, anything else out there you can take as a single entity and eat it. Wine by far at a molecular level has more complexities than anything else. And I think that's part of the fascination of wine itself. And it's been around for 10,000 years. If you were to give us a primer on how to appreciate wine, how to approach a glass of wine, what would you tell us? I would say with friends and being open about what you know. People often say you don't know how to talk about wine. You know how to talk about food? So let's pretend there's 3,000 miles between us. You're out in California watching the pretty girls in the sunset, and I'm over here in Virginia, and we're having a glass of wine. And I'm going, dude, what are you, what are you drinking? I don't know how to talk about wine. Oh, yeah, you do. What are you drinking? It's a red wine. There's an explanation. Is it a light Pinot Noir? Is it a heavy Cabernet Sauvignon? Is it vegan tannic? Is it fruity? Is it structured? Does it have a lot of acidity to it? Does it have a lot of oak, chewy tannins to it? Have a lot of alcohol to it? And your answer is, I don't know. Let's take it apart bite by bite. So if you were to talk about the color of a wine, there's conversations and words about the identification of color. You talk about the aromatics of a wine, pour a glass, have a smell. There's the beginning aromatics, there's the mid aromatics, there's the finishing aromatics. Mm. In the same way that when you taste wine, 
there's a flavor that is the first flavor, the mid palate, and the finish of the wines. And if you were to take the different isolates of wine and the texture too, wine has a lot of texture too. There's beginning texture, which is often acidic. And then the middle texture has some thickness to it and some texture to it, some granular texture maybe. And the finish might be glycerin driven. And if you take the beginning, mid and finish of the texture, the aromatics and the flavor and make a little graph, you have nine different points. So those three things have a beginning, mid and finish mm -hmm. and your little graph is nine points. And if you think about each of those nine points and then try to add individual uniqueness to those nine points, now you have something to talk about. You have something to appreciate and you can talk about the complexity you want. A great wine is different in each of those nine quadrants. So as you come through and say the aromatic starts as a bright, clean, citrusy star fruit, and it has some gingery spice to it, and it lingers with blah, blah, blah. Mm. And now you are trying to find the evolution. As with a good steak, a good steak is gonna have some crispy burnt bits, little fatty bits. It's gonna be medium rare in here, rare on the inside. It's sure. more well done on the outside off a nice smoky grill. You get the smoky component, get the fat component. Yeah. So how do you describe a good piece of beef? I think a wine is very similar to that. And wine supports food and food supports wine. Is Virginia the Napa of the East? Of no, the and Napa is not the Virginia of the West. Napa is an awesome place. Yes. Yeah. It's bumper to bumper, winery to winery, to vineyard. <laughs> um, Virginia doesn't have that. There's right. places in the world that are just the best places to grow grapes. Yeah. Virginia has 4,000 acres of grapes planted. And how many acres of land is there in Virginia? I don't know, but square miles is pretty big. So our wineries are not that close together. The benefit that Virginia has in the 1970s, the laws were created to allow wineries to exist as we know them today. It was before the early 1970s. Agriculture was agriculture where you grow grapes. Wine production was commercial. Mm -hmm. And where you produced wine in a commercial environment was not agriculture, so therefore you could not make wine where you grew the grapes. So when those laws changed, Virginia's legislature allowed winemaking, which was commercial, on agricultural property. It gave wineries the right to sell their own product as well. So we have the value-added product of wine, the grapes, the raw product, and it didn't have a lot of restrictions. Most of California, most of the wine world, does not allow what we do with people at suit that we do every day in Virginia. You can have a bottle of wine, you can have a picnic, you can have consumption, you can have a wedding, people that bring a guitar, whatever you're gonna have in Virginia, people assume that's how the rest of the wine world is. It isn't. Mm -hmm. Most wineries in Napa Valley do not have alcohol consumption on premise. You have a wine tasting and you leave. You can't have a glass of wine, you can't have a bottle. You go across Europe, you go across most of the world of wine, Agro-tourism is a very new thing and laws have had to change and people's styles had to change to allow the activity that we take for granted here. So I'm very fortunate that Virginia has allowed us to have the sales of wine at the vineyard where the wine is produced, otherwise industry today would never be what it is here. So it's a really unique combination of agriculture, being able to sell product on premise, and have the experience of the winery all all at the same time. Not just the tasting, but you can consume a, a glass, a bottle. It's the full experience. And it has to be on the economic side, on the business side of things. You have to have a, a vineyard professional. And that agricultural professional is a full-time job to manage 10 acres of grapes. So you have to have a winemaker who has a different discipline, a different understanding of the sciences to make good wines. You want a retail person to sell that wine. Mm -hmm and the management and the disciplines of having any small business from payroll compliances. We fill out 128 forms per year to our different governments selling, giving taxes from yeah. excise tax to the federal government, which is in gallons, to the state government, which is in liters, yeah. to unemployment tax. So 128 <laughs> forms per year, I count it, it's a real number. Oh, wow. So that discipline of a small business as well. So yeah. it takes enough different hats that are professional to run an organization to create the value of the payroll to make enough to where you can sustain a winery. And so the winery's got to do a million dollars a year to grow the grapes to make the wine to pay for the professionals to really have it be sustainable. And that's not easy.
Chris took me on a rare peek inside their wine chiller room, where they were preparing their 2020 vintage of Viognier, one of Pearman's signature wines. In the wine production, we use these tanks for juice and as pre-bottling. So we're in pre-bottling mode right now. This is Viognier. We have three tanks filled and the wine, we chill down to near freezing. But a wine that's really cold, it'll precipitate out certain solids, tartaric acid. So we get it cold for about a week before bottling. And this is completely filled. And to give you a little taste of what we're doing, next week we're going to uh, keep bottling this wine. So that is, there's a term in vino veritas, in wine there is truth. And the big reason being, this is all of our Viognier for one calendar year. So every bottle is going to be the same. You can't lie about a bottle of wine. Maybe you can lie about a bottle of wine. You can't lie about a thousand or ten thousand bottles of wine or a hundred thousand bottles of wine. So in Vito Veritas, in wine, there's truth. The truth is, you drive through the vineyard and you see the hard work. The truth is, here is our warehouse of wine. The truth is, here is one day's bottling, three of these things. This is about three hours of bottling. And that is the same unit again and again and again. So we want consistency with the vintage. So our 2020 vintage Viognier will be the same bottle to bottle to bottle. In wine, there's truth because I can't make it different. I can't take a great bottle of wine and give it to a wine critic and have the rest of you guys. That wouldn't be fun. <laughs> right, it might right. be fun, it wouldn't be fair. So that is the truth of what our vintage is for 2020 to be bottled next week. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Oh, thank you for sharing this with us. It's kind of fun. This is, uh, yeah, this is the end of a uh, year and a half worth of work. So last March, we started pruning the vines, took care of the vines all year, harvested them at the end of September, fermented, put this wine into the barrel late October. Mm -hmm. Some of the wine went in the barrel, some stayed in stainless steel. We blended it together. It's been cold for a week. We're going to filter it literally tomorrow and mm -hmm. bottle next week. And that will be our vintage of Viognier. How many bottles will this container yield? So this is completely filled, just over a thousand gallons, about 450 cases, 5,000 bottles. Wow, that's incredible. So that's 15 bottles a day for you. Can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> I accept that challenge. All right. Chris and I made our way to the Pearman Cellars barrel room, where we continued this fascinating conversation. How did you get into winemaking as the gap that you felt like, this is my calling that I need to fill? Now, I love food and I cooking. Took a lot of years of cooking school. I was cooking in high school. And when I got out of high school and sometime in the military, went back to cooking again and love food. And so working in restaurants was a good way to meet pretty girls and make some money. And working at better restaurants, they had better wine lists. So working with the wines at the back in the kitchen, I appreciated wine very early. When I became front of house manager, I wanted to be wine focused because I loved wine as one of my passions. When I knew enough about restaurants to where I could own my own restaurant, I wanted to have my uniqueness. I wanted to fill the gap. And the gap in Washington, D.C. at the time was there was no winemaker who owned a restaurant in Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Hmm. So I wanted to go to a winery to learn winemaking, learn grape growing. And I went to a winery 30 some odd years ago and said, I want to work for you. They gave me a job at six bucks an hour. And I go, I want to do everything. I will do everything, but you have to let me do everything. And if you don't let me do everything, I'm going to go somewhere else because I want to do everything for two years. I was there for six years. The first year, I was taught how to make wine. The second year we started a mobile bottling company. I worked for 40 wineries in 10 states. The third year I was general manager there, winemaker and consultant up and down the East Coast. Fourth year bought this vineyard, which was the largest vineyard not associated with a winery in the state of Virginia. The fifth year I became president of the state association. The sixth year I burned out and quit and I became <laughs> employed by Total Beverage and uh, I walked in to be a wine consultant. 45 minutes later, I walked out as assistant store manager and <laughs> became head of training, became a store manager, I became the education guru for, for Total mm -hmm. back in the day. And that led to 
opening wineries. The first winery from scratch was Unicorn in 1999. Mm -hmm. Since yeah. then, I've opened 18 wineries. And my goal was, I want to spend two years learning about the wine industry because I wanted to go to D.C. to be a restaurateur who knew a little bit about wine. Yeah. And here it is 30 years later, and I'm still learning. and still filling cracks. I get to drink on the job. You must have an amazing tolerance. People who work with us have a lot of tolerance. So, <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Product. Mm -hmm. Yes. We sell product, we sell memories, we sell tangibility. Absolutely. This is a barrel of wine. Virginia is different than Napa Valley. Virginia is different than France. And what we have learned over the years is what goes good here. Mm -hmm. So the great varieties that do good with our climate are Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, Petit Mansay, the Nat. And so this is Cabernet Franc. Fresh out of the barrel. This will not be bottled until next year. It spends about a year in the bottle. This is called a wine thief, for obvious reasons. I named it after my brother. So this is fresh wine and what the passion's about. Every year is different. Every vineyard is different. When you make food, every time it's different. A good pastry chef follows the recipes perfectly and it turns out different. They get really annoyed. I'm not a pastry chef, I never make it. I like cooking and I'll look at three recipes, read them, and then go, okay, here's what I'm gonna do differently. And my food never turns out the same twice. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And that's why I like winemaking. Winemaking is making food in a very slow decision-making process to where every decision can be thought about. Mm -hmm. Like a baseball game. What do you think? It's, it's perfect. <laughs> go, go back to what we said earlier about the different components. Does the aroma change from the first aroma to five seconds later to 10 to 20 seconds later? Does it change? Does the texture change in the mouth? From the acidity to the maybe a woodiness mm -hmm. to a fruit to a dark cherry flavors? Is there any spice in there? So how are these identifiable? And I think that's part of the fun game is to identifying the complexities. Sure. What's a good piece of music? It's identifying mm -hmm. the complexities and people who are really good about music will tell you where there's nothing. Right. And that's probably right. often the most important part. So it's not always what's there, sometimes it's what isn't. We do drink on the job, very little, but we want to know our product. Sure. One of the fun things in the wine industry is it takes a lot of beer to make good wine. <laughs> and the reason being, you come to work in the morning yeah. and you're you want to taste a couple of things and you're filtering, you're topping off barrels, you're doing stuff, you're working with your wine, you're filled with the aroma of wine. At the end of a long day, you're fed up with wine. You go, I don't want to drink any wine. I want to drink beer. And when you see a winemaker drinking beer, that means he's been working with wine all day. Yeah. And he's fed up with that flavor. He, he's in the skin. I'm going to have a beer, wash all that stuff away. In other industries are the same way. The race car drivers probably like sailboats because they go real slow. High technology computer geeks probably like to play tennis because they can watch it and you can understand the, the mechanics and the physics of that. I've always wondered the citrusy flavors in say in maybe a white or maybe the dark cherry or the or blackberry and red. Are those flavors infused or does that come from the soil? Where does that come from? Natural part of the berry when you pick up a ripe peach. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of flavors. The less ripe peach is fun for baseball. So uh, this is 100% Cabernet Franc in the oak barrel, fermented from yeast. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. So they're natural flavors. Wine is the most complex thing we can eat. And because of the acidity and low pH, about 3.5, mm -hmm. because of the alcohol, 13%, 14%, there is nothing in wine that can hurt you. There is no pathogen, mm -hmm. no bacterium. There is nothing in wine that can hurt you except for excessive consumption. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. But there, the nice thing is we are not looked at as a food source from USDA, FDA type standards of public food health and safety. We're looked after as a uh, source of income, as revenue, as taxation based, mm -hmm. as every business is no different. But there's nothing in the wine that can hurt you. Chris and I continued our conversation as we walked about the vineyard, discussing entrepreneurship, business, and personal life lessons. We even invited some friends to join us. You can see or hear the remainder of that interview in the next episode of the LifeWorks Podcast. Hey guys, thanks for watching and listening. 
hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. And check out some of these other clips from the podcast.